So there you are, staring at your project plan again, dreading the very milestones that you helped create. They seem to creep closer every time you look at them, like diamond-shaped space invaders. They seem so innocuous at the beginning. They were just lines in the sand that help you plan in broader strokes. Now they're a weight around your neck, heavy, immovable deadlines that cannot be reasoned with. They are the murmurs of doubt, threatening to drag you into a dragon's den of angry stakeholders when the fateful day arrives. If this sounds familiar, then I'm sorry to tell you that you're one of those PMs who has been using Project Milestones completely wrong. Don't worry, most of us are in the same boat. But if you want to transform your Project Milestones from a terror-inspiring burden into a North Star for team and stakeholder collaboration, then keep listening. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Galen Lowe with the Digital Project Manager. We are a community of digital professionals on a mission to help each other get skilled, get confident, and get connected so that we can deliver projects better. If you want to hear more about that, head over to thedigitalprojectmanager.com. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for hanging out with us on the DPM podcast. My guest today is a widely respected expert on product development and also no stranger to project management. He is one of the key brains behind Bose's noise-canceling headphones, as well as Apple's process for developing new products. Today, his company, TC Gen, advises heavyweight brands like Amazon, Apple, Cisco, Hewlett Packard, IBM, Mozilla, Roche, and 3M. And he's also just hired a tutor to help him learn music theory and is now composing music. So folks, please welcome Mr. John Carter. Hello, John. Hello, Galen. Glad to be here. Great to have you on the show. Really appreciate it. John, your CV, when I looked at it, I was like, everyone is probably envious of this CV. We're talking about product innovation for Bose, working with Apple, now running your own business, writing books. So I thought I'd just start off by asking, what did you want to be when you grew up? (laughs) That's a funny question. And I actually still do it in my spare time, which is to be an engineer. I've always wanted to design things and make calculations and predict performance. And so that that is something that's uh, always driven me and to this day still drives me. I love that. Yeah. Was it a big inspiration to get into the more innovation side of things? I imagine the engineering mindset lends itself to creating new things that are viable, feasible, and that people will actually use. Well, I, I'm not sure I was that thoughtful when I first uh, started, but I uh, I was a boy, prototypical boy scientist. So I had a chemistry set, I had a microscope, a telescope, I got a ham radio license. I just did all these geeky things. I just loved, I loved um, what I did so much. And I think it relates to what I love to do now, which is I loved electronics and I loved the the fact that you couldn't see electricity or electrons, but yet you could measure it and do something with it. And today you can do the same with sound. You can't see it, but it has tremendous impact on how you feel and think and so forth. And so I've always enjoyed uh, trying to understand phenomena you can't see. There you go. Was there an inspiring moment in time where you decided, you know what, let's take this out of an engineering context and put it more towards technology and the digital world or products? I, in a way, um, it, it really naturally uh, arose from my work with Dr. Bose at, at the Bose Corporation, where I started. He was phenomenal both with marketing and engineering at the same time. It's very, very unusual capability. And he would ask basic questions about what people care about, what they'd like to do, what's important to them. And through his approach to living and life, I really understood the importance of really trying to understand your customers' needs and and um, really make sure that you deliver on what really is important to them. And we'd learned that in so many ways, even being the inventor, we had no idea really what the customers would value until you put it in their hands. So um, I, I think it was a gradual introduction through Dr. Bose and his uh, tremendous market insights that caused me to turn from just engineering to innovation. That's awesome. I love that. And I mean, you've done so much in your career. These days, is there anything you're just trying to get better at? Uh, always, always. 
Um, it, uh, there are a couple of things. One of the things that I think is really interesting is the intersection of agile and project management. I think that's fascinating. And the other is the ramifications of what I would call digital product development. What is it like to work on machine learning versus typical product development? H how do you innovate in that kind of digital environment? And this, uh, this whole uh, new remote work, it's just fascinating what's going on. And so I really try and understand what's pushing the wave front uh, of, of innovation. Awesome. Love that. Um, I just wanted to ask, has there been anything else that you found recently that's just making your life awesome? Well, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the things that's really uh, renewed my faith in mankind is the ability to continuously innovate. Um, if you look at the current uh, set of problems uh, in front of us and the fact that we is basically as as the world have had to pivot on things like remote work, on education, on drug development, delivery. I mean, there's there's positive transformations that are a result of this um, crisis that we're now in. That really is building my confidence in our ability to out innovate uh, any situation that we confront. So that gives me a lot of hope. I love that silver lining on an otherwise perhaps suboptimal scenario for us as humankind. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Uh, so I thought maybe let's talk about your recent post uh, that you posted to the digital project manager about project milestones. So firstly, it made me feel like I had been going about project mo milestones completely wrong. Secondly, it really got me thinking about the connection between project milestones and a product's success or failure in the marketplace, which is a way I had never really looked at the problem before. Uh, but I thought maybe let's rewind and start from the beginning. First of all, in your mind, what are project milestones and, and why should anyone care about them? Right. It's a great question, great place to start because I think people's um, beliefs about milestones are wrong when it comes to digital project management. And, and the way that they're wrong is milestones are not a way to measure progress. There are many, many other better ways to measure progress that don't weigh down the team and produce volumes of irrelevant reports and then cause uh, micromanagement uh, because they now are aware of more things. So um, the common misperception is, is you use milestones for tracking. But really, if you look at milestones, what they are is inflection points in the project. They're critical periods or decision points in the life of a project uh, where either you're about to invest more or take on more risk or make or, you know arrangements and agreements with partners or what have you um, that probably do deserve the uh, benefit of doing your homework. And the other thing is that uh, in, in this complex con interconnected digital world that we live in, there's a lot of uh, dependencies between project attributes. And milestones are a great way to synchronize on dependencies. You can have two teams that are both working ag in agile fashion, but there's some point at which the uh, work of one team needs the output of another. And milestones are a great way to coordinate that kind of activity. I love that. And Thinking through that, I mean, you mentioned some of the common misconceptions of milestones, you know, fixating on tracking and reporting. What is some of the impact that that has to a project if you are approaching milestones that way instead of thinking about team dependencies? Well, uh, there's so many things. First of all, it kind of erodes any belief um, in that the management trusts the team. In other words, if the the, the projects are filled with lots of check-ins and management reviews and milestone reviews, the team actually is constantly looking over their shoulder wondering what management is thinking. This is a corrosive um, attitude because it really doesn't um, bolster the team's self-confidence and the ability to really uh, deliver a, a project that's excellent based on their own initiative, which they all believe they can do. But f furthermore, it's a, it's a drag on the team because you're constantly producing reports that are skimmed or not read or briefly overlooked and tedious graphics and updates. And what's the point of it? Is it to make a decision? Is it to communicate? Well, if it's to communicate, you can use project 
dashboards or backlogs or any number of different ways to communicate progress. If it's decisions, you know, what, what really needs to be um, relegated beyond the team, that's when you need a, a big milestone. And those are few and far between. So the, the idea is to reduce the frequency and number of these uh, reviews and make sure they're value added for the team. And that's really important in, in how you might implement milestones that are effective. I like that. It's more about doing the work than pausing to evaluate it or report on it. it, and it I think- exactly. Exactly. And then you have unfortunate courage is management to, quote, unquote, add value. <laughs> and then add a bunch of empty calories onto the team that they have to then expend to produce a see more report so someone can see more. And it's just an endless amount of uh, management throwing chairs in the, the path of the team uh, where really the management should basically eliminate obstacles and get out of the way. And that's another way in which uh, milestones can cut two ways, too many encourages micromanagement, meddling, um, right number encourages the right kind of decision making. Awesome. And was there a point in time where you paused in the project that you were managing and said, okay, I'm going about this the wrong way. This should be actually more about team and teamwork than about reporting. Yeah, it was, uh, it was soon after I was, I was promoted to chief engineer at Bose and, and in, in that situation, um, I had a tendency to micromanage, to call more reviews and do more project milestones and sprinkle them in. And I suddenly realized I was dying because I couldn't find the, the, all the time in the week to schedule all these minutia, these uh, reviews filled with minutia. And the second thing is that it, it didn't help the teams either. So I was drowning, the teams were drowning. And then I realized, and this was sobering, that some of these team leaders and tech leads knew a lot more than I did, <laughs> a lot more. And I should just get out of the way. I don't know what I'm talking about. And that realization that uh, one engineer said that uh, in the dev organization said I was just creating distortion, delay, and noise. <laughs> and that was probably <laughs> the point at which I stopped doing so many uh, milestone reviews. And when you stopped, did you notice like an overnight difference in the way that team was operating? No, not really. I think it became incrementally more productive. And I became a lot happier in my job. I found out the team actually executed just just as well, if not better, without my meddling. Uh, so I think what it does is it just lifts the veil off the team, makes them more productive, uh, happier, more content, and deliver better products. Love that. Yeah, it's amazing the weight of mistrust. And when things are coming from a place of mistrust, it's a heavy burden for the team versus the trust that the job is going to get done and everyone's collaborating effectively and managing themselves effectively. Yeah, it's like an ever-present caustic atmosphere. I agree. Awesome. Let's talk a bit more about how to go about doing it the right way and also what it looks like when you're doing it right in terms of project milestones. So you mentioned that milestones are more for the team than for project managers or for management. Uh, like, How do you groom a team to see it that way if that's not how they're seeing it already? Well, this, uh, in fact, gets back to this mistrust environment that you talked about. And what's really critical is for the team to have a, a competent product owner, a competent scrum master, or digital project manager, and a competent tech lead. If you have those three things, then management should trust you and they should trust the system. And if you have competence in your team, there's no need for constant micromanagement. And then what you can do is you can really work with the team so that they understand, well, here are the key milestones, and this is why they're important. And I think that's the most important thing. And also, milestones should never be on a fixed interval. 
So you shouldn't have weekly standing meetings or monthly review meetings or quarterly reviews. I mean, some are, are, are necessary, but not at the detailed level in general. And the, the notion is milestones should be event-driven. They're project-driven. They're based on the speed, maturity, size, risk, et cetera, of the, the team, as well as, obviously, the challenge and the task. But um, that's a, it's a, a, a clear indicator. If, if your milestones are on calendar dates that are regular, there's a problem. It almost speaks to mistrust. It's like, I'm going to check in on you it, every two weeks exactly, just to make sure exactly. it's on the rails <laughs> versus, exactly listen, at this right. point, we need to look at where we're at because there's other things that depend on it and how are we going to plan or collaborate on those next steps. Exactly. Or we're going to write, you know, the seven-figure check. Are we, are we sure we're doing the right thing? Uh, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> when you put it like that, yeah, very important. Very important. Or eight-figure um, check. It can be big checks, yeah. Well, there, there you go. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then in terms of sort of knowing when a team is ready, like having those roles um, and knowing that they are strong at the role that they're playing in the team, what kinds of behaviors do you expect from a team who is really ready to own their own milestones and understand what they're all about? Uh, Galen, this is a terrific question, and I think it, it can be answered very simply. Excuse me, and that is history. In other words, has this team been predictable in the past? Does their history, does the 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 their success and achievement in the past, does it indicate a positive um, outcome? And I think this, you know, this whole thing of trust is built over time. And certainly the best gauge of any project team is, is their past history and success in programs. So I think that's the first and foremost thing. I think, you know, you need in the, each one of the, 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 those, those key positions, for example, in product, you really need someone that understands, you know, the why and the what. They really have to know that stuff and the team has to believe them. And same on the tech, the tech lead and dev and, and QA, you have to believe in their uh, ability to make the right architectural decisions and trade-offs uh, to achieve the project goals. And in the case of the digital project manager, you've got to have confidence that they will be transparent. And so when there's a problem, they basically make it known quickly and don't hide things. And I think these kind of behaviors in these three key roles will, will signify readiness besides history. I love that. I love that the whole concept of, you know, team makeup and team building strategy. And, you know, you do want experienced folks who are approaching it from a mature lens and understanding the context of what they're doing. And yes, maybe supported by more junior folks. There's definitely room for them still. But in terms of having the right folks, you mean having experienced team members who can look at the project and the product that they're creating in the right way to then understand what the milestone means and to help plan those milestones for the project. Absolutely. And in fact, the junior roles may outnumber the senior roles by quite a bit, but you need, and I'm not talking about age, you just need cycles of experience, uh, so-called mm -hmm. learning cycles. And so if they've got several under their belt and they've been good experiences, I think you can certainly trust the team. I like Absolutely. that, learning cycles. Yeah. That's great. And then I guess my other question would be on the other side. So if you're dealing with a management team that is used to having monthly milestone check-ins or wants there to be a dozen milestones in a very brief period of time because they are so used to, and maybe they do trust the team, but they're just hardwired to want to check in and micromanage. How do you get a team like that, a leadership team or a management team to adopt a different way of thinking about milestones so that they're fewer and further between and they're not a regular cadence? Right. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a really great question. And the answer is, Galen, it depends. So if, if in the organization, um, there is a mechanism for providing some kind of measure of progress, whether it's backlogs or story points or um, deliverables that have been uh, completed, there are all sorts of simple metrics which are gauges of progress um, that are objective. And I think 
that's that's the degree to which they're lightweight and objective is really important. Um, they can be supplied as a proxy. I think the challenge with managers is they they confuse transparency and monitoring project uh, progress with decision making, and those two are totally different communication forms. Um, and then in terms of uh, progress tracking, that can be done with dashboards or all sorts of transparent indicators, or worst case, it can be done in a meeting, but just with one individual on a, f- a frequency that is is driven by need. But uh, there there is a confusion with managers. And so what we need to do is we need to assure them that they can transparently see progress and also be be assured that they are notified if something goes wrong. And although we didn't really talk about boundary conditions in this article, there's a notion of a team having limits to what's within, let's say, the threshold of what they've agreed to on Mm -hmm. their digital project development. And if they're not going to achieve those, it's incumbent upon the team to, in fact, inform management. So if management, therefore has a way of transparently seeing the team's progress and also is confident that there's a mechanism so that they'll get bad news quickly, then in fact that should be adequate. And they trust the team Mm -hmm. because they've, they've seen their history. With those three factors, I think we can make a compelling case to management for the need for less milestones. Does it make sense, Galen? Absolutely. And I love that sort of separation and disambiguation between like reporting and tracking versus decision making, which really is what right. milestones are about a, a moment in time to say, how are we doing not progress wise, but that point where we were going to enter into that, this next phase or add this other team to collaborate with us. Are we ready for that? Is that still the right thing to do? Exactly. Exactly. Love and that. are they ready for us? You know, it's right. a great point and a value-added check-in. Which, I mean, I guess brings me to my next question just in terms of, okay, well, when we're planning milestones, like, does this perspective, does your perspective on milestones change the way that we actually create them in the first place? When we're developing our project plan, our habit may have been to say, okay, well, we do a check-in quarterly or we're doing a check-in because we need to update the steering committee. Does it change the way you plan projects if you're thinking of it as milestones for the product and for the team? Yeah, for sure. So all those other status reports and steering committee updates and so forth, those would be diminished or eliminated. And what we're talking about is a light work framework to do digital product development. And this framework should have a set of standard inflection points that are appropriate for your business. So different organizations have different um, constraints. You know, if you're, I don't know, if you're making widgets, you've got to order inventory and parts and so forth. Well, that's a big expenditure. You probably want to make sure you've got the right parts specified. <laughs> it's really important. Uh, and similarly, if you're trying to ramp a digital project, you want to make sure that the right kind of instrumentation is included in the product. So you want to make sure that you can get the kind of analytics that your team wants. Well, it's important to make sure that that instrumentation is ready to go when you launch the product. So it, it really depends on, on what your business is, but those milestones in general should be standardized. Mm-hmm. Uh, there should be few, and I like to say um, there should be as little process as possible and not any less. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea is to really make it lightweight and put in standard milestones where your business typically makes the big decisions. And it should be a small handful, like I'd say three, three to five. And I, I love that example of widgets, um, or if you had to order parts, it just makes sense. You have these dependencies that sensibly, before you go and do that, you want to make sure that you are at a point where it makes sense to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and in the case of typical digital developments where you've got a cloud activities, you've got what's going on in the client, and then you may have a desktop, you've got a lot of different systems that need to be integrated and and 
DevOps that needs to be coordinated. So each business is different. For sure. Uh, one of the things that was I found really fascinating about your article was you talked about having three major milestones or inflection points during a project that would correlate with major business goals. Can you explain a bit uh, about what those are and, and why they're important? Yeah. Um, well, the first, I think, is so important, especially when you're talking about innovation and this notion, Galen, we talked about capital I innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, the innovations that are, are game changing. What you want to do at the very beginning of your digital project is think about, is this concept really aligned with our strategy? Does this fit who we are as a, a brand? Is this the sort of product or idea that we want to bring to the marketplace? Will this move the needle in terms of revenue or margin? In other words, we're going to be committing to this activity for the next three, six, nine, 18 months, potentially a large team. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be aligned with our strategy and move the needle? So the first thing you do is you, you check that there's a concept fit. Second most important thing, given there's con there's a concept fit, and it's aligned with strategy, you want to make sure you've got product market fit. In other words, do you in fact have something that consumers will choose? Do you have unique selling propositions that are meaningful to consumers? Do you have some virality in terms of the marketplace? Can you in fact encourage other users or, or larger shopping cart experiences or whatever the goal is? Do you have proof points of your acquisition cost? All these things now are in the, in the era of digital projects and products are measurable. And so the, this next phase is really important, especially before you really scale the team is make sure you have product market fit. Mm -hmm. And then the, the last is is this development and market launch. So this is basically, all right, the organization says the concepts aligned, the product and the, the market fit. In other words, consumers really like what we're doing here now. Now, in order to, to make this a feature complete re re release, MVP and then feature complete, what are we going to need to develop? to get this on board. What kind of partners are we gonna need on the cloud and infrastructure side? What kind of development partners are we gonna need for the different mobile platforms? You know, we'll do the, the desktop and tablet work in here. How are we gonna partition this? Uh, we've gotta invest in UI, and graphic design and so forth. And so we're gonna need to spend big. Are we, are we gonna commit to that? And that is really the commitment to go for development and market launch. And so these kind of are the three key inflection points um, that really govern most digital project, the product development. And obviously it can be tailored, you know, what's mm -hmm. important to you. Maybe there's another stage, an idea, ideation stage you put on the front. Maybe you have a more explicit uh, validation phase at the end. Maybe there's DevOps going on. There's all sorts of wrinkles that you can add to this, but having a common framework so that executives, when you're dealing with, and this is what, what we work um, at Apple, uh, developing their Apple new product process, is you wanna have, when a company's scaling, you wanna have a few standard milestones so you can compare where projects are. Because that allows executives then to manage the spend over time by, you know, essentially managing the flight pattern. And, and these standard milestones, these inflections that are important, tell you where the project truly is with regard to customer access and, and investment. I love that idea of just, yeah, benchmarking across projects. And especially if you're a company that's developing multiple projects at once or products at once, rather, you need to kind of look at this pipeline and see where things are at in terms of not the health of the project in terms of progress per se, but the health of the actual concept for the product and how the product is evolving in terms of when that's going to launch and when it's going to require certain resources. Right. And, and in fact, if you look at these three milestones that we talked about, Galen, none of them were really hinged to a time. Mm -hmm. They were all about, hey, is this aligned with strategy? Good. Hey, is there product market fit? Good. 
hey, do we want to really invest and spend to launch this sucker? Good. And and those are, you know, three very important non-time specific elements in the program. And certainly managing the three of those can't be too onerous for any organization. And, and would you say that if you have, let's say you have these three set up in, in, in your project plan, are they immovable? A lot of folks kind of the way we conceive of project planning, milestones are the things that can't move. What are your feelings on on, on milestones in that regard? Well, I, there's a, you know there's the difference between a hope and reality. Um, in the case of pure agile software development, it is theoretically possible to not quote unquote miss a milestone, but really what you're doing is missing, not missing or moving a sprint as, as opposed to a milestone. Uh, and even in, uh, uh, in agile development, there's a notion such as feature complete as, Mm -hmm. you know, being really important. So I, I think that these, these milestones are absolutely generic and apply to any situation and, and really will help, help speed innovation. Love that. I I wondered if maybe you could talk about some examples just to kind of make it real for our listeners of, you know, what, what might a concept fit milestone be? And then what would its subsequent product market fit be? Um, if you have any real world examples or if you want to just sure. use a hypothetical example. No, no, I, I've got, uh, re- we recently set up this system. We called it the venture board. So it was a venture capital setup within a large technology organization. And we went through this basic framework and and out of it came some really interesting and concrete lessons that are specific. One of the things that um, we think is really important for concept fit and a tangible example of that kind of milestone is first, is it aligned with the true north of the company? And so what we would do is we'd often look, create a strategic map of project ideas And your idea might be on the map and there'd be other candidates for uh, digital development on the map as well. The map contains two dimensions. One dimension is the alignment with strategy, the true north. The other dimension is financial impact. How much will it move the needle? And so first and foremost, you look at concept fit is we've got this, we've got this market basket of ideas. Is your idea that you'd like to, uh, uh, develop, is it going to move the needle and is it truly aligned with our brand? And there's a checklist you can use for that and there's a strategic map that can help you with this kind of decision. With regard to product market fit, that's different in that that involves external parameters, you know, and I think cost of acquisition is probably the most important metric that one would be looking at in terms of product market fit. But it also could be key uh, understanding of the uh, unique selling proposition. What do consumers uh, want? You know, this, this um, for example, goes back to my headphone experience. Uh, so I was the inventor. And along with Dr. Bose, we were the first two on the patent. And when we were developing that, we were developing it for better sound. It would actually be better bass, um, more uniform f- over different people's heads and, and wearing situation, etc. We put it into people's hands. They didn't care about that. They wanted noise <laughs> reduction. And so believe it or not, we didn't really have product market fit, even though we were the inventors. And so what we did is we pivoted and we sought then to maximize noise reduction, not the tonal balance and and frequency response and all that stuff. So this product market fit is really, really important. And the only way it can be truly measured is contact with customer in some form. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the, the last milestone, and I think the real example there is, do you have a business case? In other words, does this really map out? You know the cost of acquisition now. You know the product market fit. It's aligned with strategy. Now, does it math out? In other words, does your cost of does the margin you make from the product greatly exceed the cost of acquisition? What are you going to need to launch the product, et cetera? And so, if you can convince yourself on the math that 
that you can do this this math and you end up with a profitable high volume digital product then it's worth worth going for and so those are the the three inflection points it's kind of strategic fit map and second is acquisition cost and customer market customer market fit and then finally does it pencil out those are three key milestones and ways that I've seen companies use them effectively. And they, they're added value. I mean, you you want to go through those, any team. And this scaling goes back to your point about milestones not being like schedule driven. It's like, mm -hmm. what's going to make this product successful? Yeah. And what I like is that as a decision point in the headphone example, it wasn't like, okay, well, you know, we need to start again, or this is a failure, or this, you know, we, we missed this milestone. You, you use it as a, as a point to evaluate the product you were making, realized you need to pivot and then use the rest of the runway to make it something that actually is the right fit. Right. And we did it early. I mean, that's the key. Mm -hmm. That's the key. I like that. I like that. Um, I have to ask, and you brought it up earlier, just with the focus on agile, why do you still need milestones? Should a project manager planning a project using an agile methodology still care about milestones? What do they look like there? Yeah, so this is a common misperception, uh, and I think a really bad one, which is that Agile and, and milestones aren't compatible. Well, the fact is that this is a dirty secret. Just about every company that I know, quote unquote, who's doing Agile has milestones. Not a one that I know of doesn't. So it's this myth that's propagated by uh, religious fanatics. <laughs> I say that with <laughs> with uh, both uh, humor and and with some truth. Um, I once gave a presentation at a, at a Scrum Masters group, and it was mm -hmm. the first time ever in uh, maybe five years that the word waterfall was mentioned in a presentation. It's just like, uh, wow, okay. Um, but but I get, I get the importance of Agile, but it's not in conflict with milestones. As, mm -hmm. as we talked about, Galen, the fact is you need milestones to manage dis dependencies, and any Agile program of any complexity has dependencies, and as part of the Sprint Zero, you do a release plan, and you determine and map out which sprint these dependencies are going to come into. And th those are milestones. You, you can call them something else, but the fact of the matter is those are milestones. And the second is any organization that's about to invest big in any kind of digital project uh, is going to ask the team, are we ready to spend? Is this a good mm -hmm. investment? And that's a milestone. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's it's – it's really a false choice, Agile versus Milestones. They coexist very well. And I think the best systems are both, use both. Awesome. Yeah. No, I... And, and I, would, uh, I would also add, I believe in small a Agile, which are what are the Agile practices that you value that really move the business forward in ways that you think are important? I think sprint planning, for example, might be one. Demos and, and customer feedback might be another. But, you know, figure out what's important from Agile and apply that. I really like that. You know, John, these tips on project milestones are all really, really valuable. Uh, and I think the one that really resonated with me and that I think will change how I do things moving forward is this notion of standard milestones. I had never really thought of it as a way to measure across projects as well, and also to set expectations with stakeholders and senior management about what types of things we're measuring across all of our projects um, and really driving that decision-making, especially when you're about to sign that seven, eight-figure check to fund that next piece or to you know, uh, order all the widgets. So I think that's, yeah, that's my big takeaway from this. And I think... Great. And it's where... Oh, I was going to say, I, I think for folks, for folks who want to start changing the way they're using milestones and adopt this, what is, what is the first step that you'd recommend that they take? Well, I think the, the most important thing is for them to understand as a business, what are those key decisions that they need to make? You know, wh where are those few important points that every project really has to go through. What are the knot holes? What are those key areas? And then agree on those and then call them the same thing. It's pretty simple, but uh, agree on them, call them the same 
thing, have every team use them. It's a great way to start. That's the way we scaled the Apple product, new product process was we simply agreed on, well, what are a few milestones? What are we going to call them? And what needs to be done by them? And let's now start using that language. It's, it actually sounds very simple, but the first step is actually to adopt. That makes lots of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And then I guess once, once you're going on this and you're using milestones this way, what's the most important thing to remember along the way? Well, I, I think this whole notion and what we started the conversation, Galen, was this loop around trust, decision-making, and monitoring. And I think if, if we can really in, engender a system of trust based on you know, capable people running their projects, and we can separate out the milestones, which are simply for decision-making, then we can leave the monitoring to something that's really, really low friction and provides the executives the information they need without uh, weighing down the team. I love that. I love that. John, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate all your insights that you've given us. And I think it's it's been life-changing for me and hopefully quite significant in terms of life-changing for some of our listeners. Thanks for an opportunity to talk about this. You clearly know something about it, and I think you've synthesized the, the key points. So thanks for this opportunity, Galen. So what do you think? What are your hacks, tips, and tricks for project milestones? What works? What doesn't? Tell us a story. Where have your project milestones failed you? What best practices have led to your big wins? Tell us in the comments below. And if you want to learn more and get ahead in your work, come and join our tribe with DPM Membership head over to the digitalprojectmanager.com slash membership to get access to our experts forum, mastermind mentorship groups, workshops, live mentorship sessions, ask me anything sessions, ebooks, templates, and more. And if you like what you heard today, please subscribe and stay in touch on the digitalprojectmanager.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.